Welcome to the Package Maintenance Team Working Group Year 3 panel discussion. My name is uh, Glenn Hinks. And I'd, I'd like to start off by just introducing uh, the Package Maintenance Working Team. So the health of the JavaScript uh, module ecosystem in part depends upon the ability of the community to maintain the core packages within it. The Package Maintenance Team is addressing these issues these issues of long-term maintenance goals by offering a place for maintenance advice, some tooling development, assistance to struggling maintainers, and guidance to folks that depend upon seemingly unmaintained modules. Our goal is to aid the maintenance and health of this software ecosystem. I'd like to start off by introducing uh, the panel, but before I do that, I'd just like to say the, the opinions expressed in this talk are our own and not necessarily those of our employers. So I'd like to start off by introducing uh, Dominicus. Dominicus, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dom. Uh, I, some would say that I'm a full stack developer. I would say that's, that's more like a all over the place uh, developer. Um, got my hands in a bunch of things and uh, in my day job, I build things for clients at Neoform. Thank you, Dominicus. Um, Dominicus has been very modest there. He does lots of uh, very interesting things. Bethany, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Griggs, and I'm a senior engineer at Red Hat, uh, where my roles all, all, my help role is focused on Node.js, uh, including spending a portion of my time contributing to the Node.js project. Uh, particularly, I'm active in the Node.js release working group, so working on getting releases of Node out there. And also, when I'm not working on that, I'm looking at um, all of our clients that are using Node in the enterprise and looking at what issues they're hitting and things like that. Thank you, Bethany. Rodian, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi, sure. So, uh, really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Rodion. Uh, I'm a software engineer working at uh, Aspire Global. Uh, my main interests are JavaScript and uh, front-end and uh, back-end development. Uh, we are developing an iGaming platform, so I'm working with uh, systems on the uh, high traffic and lots of challenging tasks. Uh, I also like uh, open source, so I'm a member of uh, Node.js package maintenance working group and also help with uh, uh, Node.js website redesign. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Darcy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Um, my name is Darcy Clark. I'm the engineering manager on the NPM Clyde team at GitHub, um, recently acquired last year. Uh, I'm pretty active in the Node community and open source JavaScript community, helping out with uh, OpenJS efforts, uh, as well as the Node projects wherever I can, uh, and collaborating with folks here in the package maintenance working group, as well as the tooling working group. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit about me. Thank you very much, Darcy. Um, my name is Glenn Hinks. I work for American Express. I work for the acquisitions uh, division. And I am uh, mostly a Node developer, or previously a Node developer. We're very much a, a JavaScript shop. And we're very interested in the long-term health of our ecosystems. Um, I'd like to start off by asking Bethany to give us a little bit of an introduction into the history of the package maintenance team. Yeah, so the package maintenance team uh, was kicked off as a result of the call to action back in uh, 2018. It was actually kicked off at the Node Summit conference. And at the time, it was just after like, there was already widespread adoption of Node.js in the enterprise. Uh, that was, we're reaching a very large number of NPM modules out in the ecosystem. And uh, a few folks had found that there were still kind of like barriers to adopting the ecosystem, the module ecosystem in the enterprise. Uh, and this was particularly around like how much choice there was and concerns around ongoing maintenance and support of the ecosystem modules. So the team was 
was announced to get together a bunch of folks who wanted to work on the challenges around module ecosystem adoption with that enterprise focus. Um, and this was also stand because at the time there were a lot of widely used modules uh, that weren't necessarily getting the maintenance and um, support that was needed um, when you look at how wide probably how wide uh, widely they were used. And so the team got together then, and since then we've been getting together probably every couple of weeks uh, to talk about various challenges and the early the early kind of work was around producing some best practice documentation for module maintainers to follow, um, particularly to help uh, bridge the mismatch and expectations some folks may have between consuming and maintaining modules. And, and then from there, the project started to get um, talk about more challenges. We found a need to produce some tooling to help support uh, no module maintainers. And we're, we're still continuing. We're still talking about new issues and building more tooling and figuring out how we can help out. Thank you very much, Bethany. That's an introduction for the team as a whole. But what I'd like to do is ask each member of this panel, what are the motivations and the state of the ecosystem from their particular perspectives as they look in at the work of the package maintenance team? I'd like to start with uh, Dominicus. Uh, yeah, so Node's ecosystem is huge, right? And uh, there's a very broad spectrum of things happening there. Um, I think there's, uh, from my personal perspective, is, is, is my personal interest is to kind of have, uh, kind of be able to sleep at night uh, quietly, knowing that, you know, the modules that we're using are uh, high quality and are uh, well maintained. Um, I, I have a particular interest in tooling and in CI tooling, uh, which uh, you know been I've been observing the ecosystem uh, how it acts in that regard. Uh, I think we have it really nice in Node.js land uh, because mostly uh, we have a very well standardized approach to you know how you do tests for uh, how you run tests for various modules right that you're using. Um, there's NPM test as a shortcut, and uh, for a very long time we had a, a very nice open source initiative from Travis, where pretty much everybody used the same setup in CI as well. Um, so yeah, just watching out for modules to be up to date. And uh, there was there was also the case that around the time that this group started, there was the uh, ESLIN scope. Uh, issue uh security problem and you know there's there's people moving on there's packages being abandoned but they're still getting a lot of use so in terms of overall health i just want you know for the customers uh to deliver the proper experience and you know the quality modules that they can use thank you dominicus Yes, everyone has their own special interests and perspective upon the work we do, but we all know it impacts all of us in so many ways. Rodian, what are your views on the current state of the ecosystem and your motivation for taking part in the package maintenance team? Uh, yeah, we all know that uh, companies that uh, build uh, big enterprise level uh, applications, they desire to depend on the stable, maintainable packages with uh, predictable releases and smooth uh, non-GS version upgrades. So uh, unfortunately, we see the situation that uh, some critical um, for the ecosystem packages uh, may not receive required level of uh, support because of increased uh, popularity of the package, uh, but in the same time, initial uh, maintainers were not reinforced with uh, relative uh, manpower uh, to deal with a growing amount of issues. So uh, from my side, uh, it would be great if uh, companies will start to invest uh, more uh, efforts in uh, support from their side uh in packages that they depend on and uh, that's why our team was created to uh, reduce this gap between package maintainers and uh, consumers thank you Rodian. that's very interesting and that's a very common view i feel from many people 
the concern about the sheer size, what happens as people that initiate modules and hand off to maintainers, what happens next? It is such a vast system, and I'm not sure that this really has happened on this scale before. Bethany, what do you think about the current state of the ecosystem and your motivation for participating in a package maintenance team? Yeah, one one particular thing is the the widespread choice, you know, with like so many million modules to choose from, knowing what's a good choice. And particularly, uh, I came from, I first started using Node when I was at university, where I would just look for a package, use it, and I was like, yes, this does the job. Um, but then joining a large corporate company like IBM, um, where we've got lots of folks using Node um, and learning how a large organization and enterprise deals with this massive choice. Um, that was a big learning curve for me and actually sparked a lot of interest um, in, for example, the concerns around like licenses, maintenance, um, what, what actually makes a module um, supported and maintained enough for you to be willing to stand, like stand your whole production application on top of it. Um, so that, that's really where a lot of my interest comes from and what, why I like getting involved because trying to, trying to figure out how we can encourage responsible consumption of modules and how to help people choose them. Yes, yeah, so th that is one of the, the you, you've hit a nail on the head. There are so many to choose from. Which ones we choose? There might be five or six that do the same thing. They might seem equally as popular. Which ones are being maintained? How do we know which ones are maintained? Um, you know, do we just use the one that has the best readme? That's the sort of thing we see. Well, this one looks like it's the easiest to use. Um, and we may find down the road that it might not be have been the best choice. So. Now we're going to talk to Darcy, who actually works at NPM for his perspective of the current state of the ecosystem and his motivation for participating in a package maintenance team. Thanks, Glenn. Um, yeah, so my original involvement was uh, is a bit selfish, obviously trying to stay up to date with um, other folks in the ecosystem um, and, and also trying to hopefully bring discussions into a form that is sort of uh, neutral, a neutral form. I really like the, what we've done here with this group. Um, from NPM's perspective in terms of the ecosystem and how it's uh, changing, evolving, uh, we can sit, continue to see exponential growth. Um, that might not be surprising to folks on this group, but we continue to see exponential growth in terms of downloads of packages, consumption of packages. Um, in October, we hit 100 billion uh, monthly downloads uh, from the registry, the NPM registry, which is an amazing milestone as an ecosystem. Um, this, uh, you know, was marked also at the 11 year anniversary of the NPM CLI. So right around the same time, we hit about 100 billion downloads. So that's that's 11 years and, and we finally hit that milestone. Uh, surprising enough, uh, this past month, we just hit 123 billion downloads. So you can see that exponential growth just continues to climb. Uh, and in terms of the registry, the things that are actually on, uh, you know, NPM, uh, we have 1.6 million packages now as of 2021. And uh, if you look at the numbers uh, from also GitHub side, who also is helping to track things, their recent uh, stats from Octoverse or, or state of the Octoverse or state of the repositories that live on, on GitHub, we saw that JavaScript continues to be the number one platform in the world for, for in terms of programming languages. And TypeScript is quickly jumping up there as well, uh, hitting you know number four uh, in terms of, of languages um, just behind Python and Java. In terms of the state of those projects, 94% of the JavaScript projects rely on open source. They rely on other open source dependencies. And the median uh, transitive dependencies is 683. Uh, if you compare that to other languages, Python is uh, 819, roughly 19 median uh, uh, transitive dependencies. Ruby 68 and PHP is 70, the closest to, to uh, you know, Node and, and JavaScript projects. So that's pretty interesting in terms of the growth uh, and, and sort of the network that we're establishing here as an ecosystem and, and sharing uh, projects with each other. Um, it's a big web and we're all working together, hopefully to strengthen, you know, our projects. So. 
Thank you, Darcy. And it is interesting to note that sometimes we have a, let's say, a selfish self-interest from a perspective that we have. But that interest actually serves the wider community because, funnily enough, we all have that same interest. We want our thing to be maintained and to be stable. But the only way to get our thing to be maintained is to do it at a much larger level, because as you say, we have so many dependencies and they're all open source, the majority of them um, maintained by volunteers in, in the community. So I'd like to give my perspective on this ecosystem. So I'm going to take a little bit of a bigger perspective, step back a little bit. Um, so I must say there was a time when the JavaScript ecosystem was actually perceived as not the realm of serious programmers or real development. Um, that time has long since passed, as Darcy has said. You just got to look at the size of it. It is now the largest ecosystem and the barriers to entry are very, very low. Very low indeed compared to other ecosystems. You do not need years of experience to make a really big positive contribution. And this makes it a very inviting community. And I look at it and I can see people with only one year's experience making packages, pushing them out, and they're being adopted. However, I, I see also see from everything we said, there's a downside to a large ecosystem. We have the most uh, dependencies, transitive dependencies, and we do see common modules becoming less commonly used. And as ideas change, we the common modules might change. And this is good for the ecosystem. We're pushing this ecosystem forwards. However, there's a basic underpinning of the ecosystem. Um, the underpinning actually comes from commercial companies. They pay for us to go to work and do stuff. And although we use this, this thing, they have revenue generating sites that often depend upon these maintained pieces of code. And sometimes some modules get superseded by others and these modules that they depend upon are now unmaintained. And when we say unmaintained, there are different types of unmaintained. Somebody may not have time. Somebody may have essentially ghosted a module and have moved on. There may be family events that have happened. And I view this as a chance to actually for people to come to an, a small team and say, there's this module. It has many downloads. Many people are dependent upon it. I, I can't contact maintainers or they're not responding. What should we do? And I think this is the first time as an ecosystem, and I, I originally was looking into the ecosystem from the outside before I joined it. And when I was on the inside, I realized it was much bigger on the inside than the outside, meaning I realized what it was. We're the, the first point of call, I think, that's been set up for this actual long-term health of the ecosystem. So that's what my, mine is also selfish. I want things I use to be maintained. And the only way to do that is to do that at this sort of uh, larger level. So I'd like to thank everyone um, for that, taking, giving us their perspectives on this particular ecosystem. I'd like to go into some of the things we've actually done in the package maintenance team. I'd like to go to the early days. This is a three year look back. When we first started, um, obviously, you know, there's lots of interest when a team is first kicked off. We, we are looking to see what our, our remit was. What were we doing? And we actually started with documentation. Um, so with many projects, the initial phases are characterized by long open discussions. And we were no different. We had long open discussions. Uh, we were composed with participants from many time zones. And our initial goals was to establish via debate what we wanted to achieve. So we started writing things down. And some of the, the first things we, we wrote down were really basic things like what license should you have? And we looked at licensing. We actually contacted NPM and we said, what are the most popular licenses? And they provided us with a nice ordered list. And from that, we made some judgment calls and said, okay, these are the commonly used ones. We recommend you should have a license. And we wrote it down. At that time, it was still very early. We weren't sure how much or how big a remit we had. So we started writing down other things. We wrote down what we thought about testing. Um, we came up with a, a governance model for our team. 
it was very much about starting off and we weren't quite sure what the entire remit was. We knew what the problem was, but how should we go about solving it? So we started off by writing things down. But we soon realized what our, our role was, was as a place that could be engaged by mostly well-known people within the community that had an issue with a module. They would come along and they would say, this module has this many downloads. And often there were many, weren't they, Darcy? Many millions. And it appears to be unmaintained or at least non-respondent in GitHub. And we wanted to become a place where we could provide some guidance. Somebody could come to us and we could say, yes, we will contact them. We will say who we are. Are you maintained? Are you not maintained? And we would wait. We provide some sort of guidance to users. It's not just a case of uh, maintainers. There's also the users of those modules. And then, of course, this leads into what we should do when we actually have to support things. So I'm now going to ask Rodian about the uh, package support tool. Um, what does support mean to you and why is it valuable, Rodian? Yes, yeah, so as a working group, we committed to uh, work on processes and, tool, uh, and, and tools uh, that uh, may reduce the gap between uh, package maintainers and uh, uh, consumers in terms of uh, expectations. So it was decided to document uh, a process of how package maintainers uh, can communicate the level of support they are going to uh, to provide uh, for the package that they create. And uh, we created a, a specification uh, called package support, uh, uh, which describes uh, how package maintainer can specify target version of uh, Node.js uh, they, uh, they will support and uh, uh, how quickly maintainer will uh, respond to issues. Uh, and uh, the bacon, so how uh, package uh, is supported and how consumers uh, may help uh, support the package. Uh, and uh, uh, based on this uh, specification, we created a tool called uh, support uh, that uh, will help uh, maintainers to create and uh, validate the structured support uh, information for their packages. And uh, this tool also can read support information in uh, dependencies three of, of, of the project. So I definitely recommend everybody to uh, check out uh, pkgjs slash support repo and uh, start uh, adding uh, support information in uh, your packages. Thank you, Rodian. And, and I'm going to continue this discussion we've, we just had about support by asking the other members of the panel, how much support do you think uh, users should be getting? And do you think that they've become a little bit spoiled? After all, most of these modules are maintained by volunteers. And we always enter into these things very you know, bright eyed, but after a few years of maintaining something, you may become a victim of your own success. Um, do we think that, do, do we see that very much in the community? I can answer the first question, right? As a user of a package, you should expect zero support, right? That's, that's the reality of, of this. Um, I think there's, uh, a lot of ethics of open source to be communicated to a lot of people. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is a certain expectation, I guess, in bet between the people that overall the community would step up to fix major issues. And I think this has happened. Uh, I think there's a bunch of uh, really well-known and widely used packages that have not necessarily exactly changed hands uh, over the past you know, few years, even, even last year, um, that have been receiving security reports, vulnerabilities, CVEs, uh, that have been getting addressed. Uh, and, and I think that overall, as long as you know, you're picking your modules carefully, uh, the community has been providing that support to, to, to kind of um, not necessarily guarantees, but the, the, a certain baseline of support where uh, issues are getting addressed in a timely manner in critical packages overall, right? 
Yes, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. On the face of it, we're kind of offering an ecosystem. However, currently we're not guaranteeing any levels of support. And I think many of us on this panel are always amused by the things we read in GitHub and the demands that are made upon maintainers who have given their time freely that, that they should provide features or services uh, to people. Um, Part of this team's remit is to try and make this process a, a bit better. What we've found is if we provide a tool that specifies maintenance levels, then we may have some um, expectations or relieve stress on users and on maintainers too. If it's unsupported, you know, they'll get there when they can. However, we do have some modules within the ecosystem that essentially people do maintain. And we've actually been developing a tool called Wibby uh, for this. And I would like to call on uh, Dominicus to talk a little bit about what Wibby is and why we think we need this tool. Yeah, uh, so Wibby is uh, a bit of an experiment, I guess. Um, it, there is an overall need uh, to have a, gener a generic tool in the ecosystem uh, that would be similar to uh, the scannery in the goldmine tool that's available for Node.js itself, whereby uh, there's nightly builds of Node or pre-release ca release candidates of Node.js uh, are getting tested against uh, the modules in the ecosystem that Node.js doesn't break these modules. And now because we have a very large ecosystem, there's lots of interdependencies between modules, right? One thing depends on, on another. And that means that as a uh, maintainer who does provide a level of support to their package, or even just, you know, uh, purely out of selfish interest, they're building the tool and don't want to, build, to break other tools uh, that they may be using themselves. Uh, because of this uh, uh, deep and wide dependency trees that we have in Node.js ecosystem, uh, you want a tool which allows you to test that whatever you're building does not break your dependence. So Wibby is an attempt at that. Uh, there have been similar tools in the past. I think there's some still available. Uh, what Wibby does differently is, um, and I guess that's the tricky part and that's the experiment part, uh, right, to see if it works, um, is instead of uh, downloading the packages and running their tests locally, it opens pull requests or pushes branches into the package repositories of dependence, uh, which allows these tests to actually run in the CI environment of that package the way it is set up. So uh, as I mentioned, we, we, we have mostly standardized in uh, Node.js ecosystem to basically you can test any package using NPM test. However, if you do that locally, that's probably going to run in the Node.js version that you have installed locally, whereas most of the packages would probably be testing against multiple, would be targeting multiple versions of Node, right? So you could have, I guess, 10, is, is it out yet? Yeah, it's probably out of support yet at this point. But if, you have, if, you, if you're supporting 12, 14, and 16, and you start to use new features, you could be breaking something in Node 14. So you want to test the whole, run the whole suite, the whole system, uh, of tests uh, with the changes that you're making. So Wibby tries to do that. And yeah, it's very much still in progress. There's a couple of unsolved issues, but we're moving there and uh, we'll see how that goes, right? I'm very interested to start using it in, 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 in real life against real packages, uh, against real, I guess, plugin ecosystems. Uh, and we're, we're getting really close to be able to do that. So yeah, looking for volunteers to test that as well. Yes, I'm, I'm super excited to start uh, uh, using the tool too. So thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Darcy now to talk about vulnerabilities because we all know that vulnerabilities cause problems and nothing freaks out the enterprise more than a vulnerability report. Darcy, would you like to comment? Yeah, so this is another area in which this group was uh, speaking to security for quite a while, trying to ideate on 
um, different initiatives that we could kick off and, and figure out how we could get involved and, and make some recommendations along uh, the lines of sort of the supports um, uh, JSON spec that sort of came, came out of that work. And so myself and Wesley Todd have become the co-champions of a new um, uh, collaboration space in the OpenJS Foundation. Um, it's the first ever. It's called the uh, Package, uh, let me get the name right, it's very long, Package Vulnerability Management and Reporting Collaboration Space. Um, and we'll be kicking off uh, essentially the first um, session there at, at this conference, and, and we'll be talking a little bit more about what we're hoping to achieve with that uh, group. Um, the idea being that uh, we would like to improve the CVE reporting and, and sort of resolution workflows that we see today. Um, going back to some of the data that I, I gave before from uh, the GitHub uh, state of the Octoverse, we see roughly 59% uh, of those 683 transitive dependencies. Um, there, up to 59% of them are going to get a security alert um, within a year of them being active on in a in a project. Um, so that's uh, that's almost. Almost the certainty is what we see in the data that there's going to be some sort of alert come by with one of your dependencies. And we see roughly 17 of those vulnerabilities that are actually filed are explicitly malicious, whereas the other 83 are actually results of mistakes. So we're trying to like reduce the churn and we want to essentially bring together security researchers um, and organizations with package maintainers and, and tooling authors like, like ourselves at NPM to try to reduce this burden and, and reduce the noise so that we improve the tooling and secure um, the ecosystem more. So that's the uh, idea behind uh, putting together this collaboration space. Um, and we're working with folks that have already been working in this space for a while. Um, and yeah, we're hoping that the outcomes of that work will be you know, in, improved tooling and, and potentially even auditing tooling um, for, for the uh, ecosystem as a whole. So that's a little bit about what we're doing in that space. And that was spun out of this group, which, which is an amazing and exciting uh, initiative. Yeah, it is quite amazing to think we've spun off some children uh, from, from the team. Um, and no one takes security lightly. And, you know, for the health of the ecosystem and its adoption within the enterprise, this is a serious thing. And it's good to have a place to go that we could point those uh, organizations to and go, we take this seriously as well. So I'd like to get back to Bethany and have her talk about... Um, what she thinks the greatest um, achievements for the package maintenance team is so far. Sure, so um, I think great achievements include like the documentation we produced, the tooling, um, and or, like getting to know the other package maintainers. But I do think the key achievement and outcome of this working group is that we have provided a neutral space where we bring together package maintainers, uh, consumers, authors, and also um, from various parts of the ecosystem. So we have the folks from NPM, we have people who are active within the Node project. Um, so bringing all of these people together to try and figure out the problems, I think that's probably the greatest achievement because we're, we're then satisfying everyone's needs and challenges rather than just like a subset of the, the uh, constituencies. Absolutely. So this is the first time I've been involved in a party group too. And, you know, I just walked up to people at conferences. Yeah, yeah, I'll help. Um, I don't know how I help. And they reached out to me and said, okay. And I said, what, you don't want me to write code? They said, no. And I think if we give that message to people, it's not just about writing code and majority of projects need other help too. So Rodian, I'd like to turn it over to you. And I'd like you to talk about your experience of how you got involved with this group. Uh, yes, so I joined the uh, working group almost a year ago, uh, and um, I heard uh, that uh, Node.js working groups have live uh, meetings on YouTube, so I decided to check those uh, recordings, and uh, I found uh, meetings for package maintenance uh, working group, and uh, after that I subscribed to uh, working group uh, repo uh, on GitHub. And uh, from one of uh, meeting notes uh, in that uh, repo, I um, 
uh, discovered a PKGJS organization with uh, uh, tooling repositories. So I subscribed to several uh, repositories there. And uh, in a few days, I think I got a uh, notification that uh, uh, some of uh, support uh, uh, tasks was failing on uh, some of uh, Node.js versions. So I decided uh, to check uh, those tests and uh, fix it. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, how I uh, got involved. So uh, everybody can start to contribute. Just make sure to subscribe to Node.js calendar. Uh, visit our meetings, subscribe to repositories, and uh, check uh, notifications regularly. So thank you, Rodin. And I'd like to reinforce that. The, the most important thing is not your ability or the level of your contribution. It's actually just participation. And I, I keep saying this to people, uh, people I work with, people I come It's actually, please participate. You'll find that you're far more valuable than you realize, no matter what your skill level is. So... I'd like to wrap up today. Um, I'd like to thank each one of the panelists. Uh, and if, if you're listening to this, uh, we will be taking questions. What I'd like to say is the number one thing with any ecosystem uh, for its vibrancy is its community. And I think whatever your level of contribution or skill level is, actually just that first initial participation often leads to uh, greater and better things. and. All I can say is there's almost no downside to participation I can think of. Uh, all I can say is there is an upside. Um, we are the largest community. I said at the beginning, we were not viewed as serious to begin with, but I think everybody knows we are very serious. We are very large and we are certainly uh, a competitor to most ways of, of doing things in what I'd call a traditional neoclassical way. We've provided a different way with a very low entry point for um, junior developers. And with that, I'd like to thank the panelists and wish everyone a uh, great day. Thank you all. <laughs>